everybody. Welcome. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here in person tonight, and we welcome you in the room. Uh, uh, it's been a long time uh, to have a Sierra event in person for the public. And also, I'd like to welcome everybody who is on Zoom. Um, and I'm not sure, usually when I've done this before, before I remember to ask, where is the camera uh, that I can look at so people on Zoom can uh, see me looking at them? Can anybody give me a hint? This one, or this one, yes. Hi, everybody. Um, so welcome on Zoom as well. Uh, to those who are in the room, thank you for making the effort. I know we're all uh, sort of getting used to coming back to in-person events, so especially thank you for being here. Um, in last year, we had our annual public lecture, which is a ma major event for us uh, on Zoom. Um, Sierra's associate director, Shane Larson, gave it, and it was a great success. We had actually a very big audience. And I know that tonight we also have a big audience on Zoom. So we may go forward with a hybrid uh, mode going forward. Um, to remind everybody, Sierra is a research uh, center at Northwestern University. Our focus is advancing research and education in astronomy and astrophysics. But we have a lot of interdisciplinary uh, connections to other parts of the university from uh, computer science, applied math, statistics, engineering, mechanical, electrical, uh, also planetary sciences, um, and even school of education and social policy and journalism. So we have a wide range of projects and we have a lot of fun pursuing these projects with postdocs and students graduate and undergraduate students. The slides you have been watching uh, throughout the uh, minutes before uh, the beginning of this uh, event uh, highlight a lot of these projects. And if you'd like to learn more uh, about Sierra, you can always uh, email sierra at northwestern.edu or look up our webpage, and then you'll find many ways to engage with us. So don't hesitate. I'd like to... Um, uh, acknowledge uh, today the members of Sierra's advisory board uh, for being here also in person and some of them on Zoom, some out of town. Uh, we had a full day today. We had our annual uh, board meeting again in pleasure to be with some of them uh, in person and we had an exciting day. Uh, Sierra has been uh, very active and it's remarkable in some ways more active uh, than one might anticipate in the past year and a half that we have been a little bit offline. Um, uh, but we haven't been really offline. And despite what uh, people have been going through, because everybody has suffered in some way or another uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have come together as a community and we have uh, worked together and supported each other. Uh, in as many ways as many ways as possible. So it's been great to be able to share with our board today what's going on. Um, I would like to, uh, also for the public, I would like to highlight that even though we could not do events in person, we had once a month uh, our students, our, our really, really amazing volunteers, students and postdocs, uh, organized uh, online events once a month, live astronomy night, um, and some of you, I bet, have watched these, and you can find them on our YouTube channel, and uh, we expect that those will continue until we can resume full in-person activities. So also welcome to any alumni who uh, might be here or on Zoom uh, because they are attending events for homecoming. So welcome to campus if you're attending tonight as well. And thank you, of course, to the volunteers, students and postdocs who made this event again possible and to all our staff who supported the whole day, our board meeting and also this annual public lecture. So now it's with uh, great excitement that uh, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Phil Plate, our speaker for tonight. And I'm wondering why I can't see my notes. It's because I need my reading glasses. Uh, so Phil is a, an international known science communicator, 
and uh, author. He has written numerous um, articles and blogs, and he has appeared in scientific documentaries. He has written uh, books, and he has appeared um, also in broadcast media. Uh, he's widely known as the bad astronomer, uh, and he's uh, the author of a widely known blog, science blog, called Bad Astronomy. The blog started in 2005 uh, and continues until today and is currently hosted by Sci-Fi Wire. What Phil tries to do with his blog, Bad Astronomy, is to uh, address the general uh, public and provide lucid and clear explanations about modern discoveries in astronomy and their significant significance, and also explain and um, uh, fight against misinformation and misunderstandings uh, and pseudoscience associated with astronomy and space. His work has been called a monumental service to the space science community. He has authored two best-selling popular books, Bad Astronomy, um, uh, with the same uh, focus, but also another book, Death from the Skies, about astronomical catastrophes that could befall uh, the Earth. Uh, what led him to science communication was actually uh, um, higher education in astronomy and research. So he got his PhD in um, astronomy from the University of Virginia, and he was studying the supernova 1987A, um, which has um, changed the way we understand massive stars and core collapse events. Uh, after his PhD, he worked on a number of different projects uh, at NASA, Goddard Sp Space Flight Center, uh, working with COBE, which is a NASA mission that actually provided key evidence for the existence of Big Bang by studying the cosmic microwave background. And later he worked at the, uh, Hubble, with the Hubble Space Telescope on one of the instruments. Um, he has been, uh, his work has been honored uh, by several awards. Most uh, recently, uh, he received the SRAM uh, David Schramm Award for High Energy Astrophysics Science Journalism for, by the American Astronomical Society for one of his articles. And in 2009, his blog, Bad Astronomy, was um, uh, honored by Time.com as one of the 25 best blogs in the world. So without any further ado, um, let's welcome Dr. Phil Plate. Thank you. Well, after that introduction, it's, uh, there's nowhere to go but down, so this ought to be interesting. Um, thank you all for coming and for inviting me. It is wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to be anywhere, uh, actually. This is my first in-person talk in two years since San Diego Comic-Con in 2019. I just looked that up. So uh, yeah, I'm the kind of guy who goes to Comic-Con. So you can expect that sort of level of, of talk here tonight. Um, but it is actually, it's lovely to be back here in Chicago. I spent a year here going to school in the South Side. And the only way this, play, this could have been better this entire week, uh, this, the day I'm spending here, is if I could have gotten some Harold's chicken. But they, uh, for those of you, really not a lot of laughing. About, there we go. Woo, Harold's, yeah. Um, but it uh, turns out the hotel I'm in is right next to Giordano's. Um, and, you know, I can write about uh, pre-solar grains and meteorites and fast radio bursts and exoplanets all day long. But post a picture of a Giordano's personal pizza, and let me tell you, you get the response on Twitter. So that was, that was cool today. Uh, so again, thank you for, for coming out. Um, I love astronomy and I love talking about astronomy and this one of the one of my favorite topics is actually something I've not done any research in myself but I I just love the topic so much I keep up on on what's the most recent science about it and that is that's exoplanets these are planets orbiting other stars when when I was a kid and I was hauling my telescope out to the end of the driveway and, and looking at stuff uh, in suburban DC where I grew up at that time, there were nine planets that we knew of in the entire universe. And now somehow there are eight. I don't, I don't make these rules. Um, but in fact, uh, we do know now of 
uh, depending on, on which database you look at, 4,500 planets orbiting other stars that have been confirmed. We're well on our way to 5,000, which is amazing, considering the first one was discovered in 1991, or at least was announced in 1991. Um, this field has come a long way, and um, for me, it is kind of magical, because I grew up watching Star Trek, Lost in Space, and I say this every time and I never get a reaction. I don't know why, I, I'm just hoping. Space 1999, yeah, every, every, all the fans of that show are dead. That show's, that show's been out so long. Um, and and th th those shows inspired me uh, to be a scientist. And the science that I love so much in, informs the science fiction that I like to watch. And in fact, when I was developing this talk, um, it was for a Star Trek cruise. And so that's why I called it Strange New Worlds. Um, the original title was Is Earth Special? And I couldn't decide which one to go with. But I, I kind of like Strange New Worlds. Thought of it before. The Star Trek folks decided to name one of the new series Strange New Worlds, so they owe me. Um, one, of the, one of the things about science, astronomy, sure, but science in general, is when you discover something new, and if it's just one thing, and you go, well, I, you, generally the reaction is, well, that, that's weird. Uh, what do we make of this? We don't know what this thing is. And, and it's, when there's one object, you know, what, how do you study it? How do you put it in context? When you have 4,500 of these objects, uh, it changes. You can start looking for trends. You can do what I like to think of as zoology. You can say, you know, this animal has four legs. Well, that animal has four legs. Well, this animal is warm-blooded. Well, this one's cold-blooded. Ah, right, there are differences. And we can start looking for these things, compare and contrast. Remember how much you hated writing those, those essays in fifth grade? Um, turns out that's important. And you can learn about not just the objects themselves, but what is going on? What's the science behind them? Why do they do whatever it is they do? Uh, and the more you have of these things, the better. And the beauty of astronomy, uh, as opposed to every other science, which, you know, those are boring. Um, the, uh, I'm kidding. The, the, the thing about astronomy is it's a big topic. It's everything in the universe. But we live on a planet, and that's Earth, of course. And we know a lot about this planet, but how does it compare to other planets? And as we find more of these alien worlds, we are able to put our own planet in context. And that is critically important. So when I think to myself, you know, why are we looking for these other planets? There's scientific interest. It's just cool. We can learn more about planets and how they form and how they're related to stars and how stars are born and how galaxies behave. These are all connected. Um, we live on Earth. And we want to know, is there another Earth out there? Uh, are we going to find another planet that looks a lot like Earth and that may be habitable? And I think that's a, that's a fair reason to do this. Uh, and so the question then becomes, are we going to find another planet like that? Or is Earth unique? And so um, in the next 72 hours of this talk, uh, I'm going to go over that and talk about, is Earth special? And um, spoiler alert, the answer is no, maybe, yes. Uh, it depends on how you ask that question. What do you mean by special? So, let's talk about Earth. People always ask me, what's your favorite planet? And they always expect me to say Saturn. And I say, well, I'm, I'm, I live on Earth, so I'm biased. Um, it is a planet it, in every sense of the word. It is floating out in space. It is a gigantic ball of metal and rock and air and water. Uh, and in fact, this is a very typical kind of view you see in books and on the web, and you can see um, Africa and Saudi Arabia, and I, I'm looking at my monitor down here. I'm sorry if it looks like I'm just falling asleep. I'm just looking down here. Uh, Europe, you can see Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, a bunch of different things. This is a very typical view of Earth. This is taken by a satellite that is about um, a million and a half kilometers towards the sun with its back towards the sun. Sorry, that's about a million miles. I, I use metric a lot. I can switch. I can also do this in furlongs if you give me a minute. Um, and it looks towards the Earth, and it takes several pictures a day. And you can, you can watch the Earth rotate. You can see the weather changing on it. Um, this, is, this is one view of it. But this is a different view that you don't usually see. That is Earth. Um, but that's the Pacific Ocean. 
And I love this picture because the Pacific Ocean is huge. You don't have any idea how big it is until you see it like this. It is the entire half of the planet. On the lower left, you can kind of make out Australia there, right on the limb. Uh, on the upper right uh, is the west coast of the US. You can see California and the Sea of Cortez there. Um, but it's mostly ocean. I did not appreciate how big the Pacific Ocean was until I flew from San Francisco to Australia. And we left, we left San Francisco airport and in five minutes, we were over the Pacific Ocean, and then 13 hours later, right, we pass over the coast of, uh, of Australia and landed in Sydney, and it's like, we've been over the ocean this whole time. It is enormous. Earth is a water planet, uh, and in this picture, you can actually see three different kinds of water. Um, as you think of water, there's liquid water, that's the blue. There's um, water vapor, that's the clouds, and at the, the North Pole there, or maybe the South Pole, eh, I guess the North Pole, um, there's ice, solid water. So it's existing in these three different states, these three different phases, solid, liquid, and, and air, or, or gas. Um, and that is interesting. The Earth has a lot of water, and it's at the right distance from the sun that, these, that the water can exist in these three different states at the same time, and they feed into each other. Um, rivers will dump water into lakes, the lakes will evaporate, that turns into a gas, and then it, 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 it might snow out and then eventually melt and feed the rivers again. And you get this water cycle that they teach you about in sixth grade science because it's a standard. Um, this is interesting because water is a fantastic substance. It, it exists as a liquid over a large range of temperatures. If you put enough ingredients in it and shake it up, stand back and wait a billion years, you can get life in there. Uh, and it helps that uh, water can actually mix things up. Rivers can sweep up materials that can be used as nutrients for life, bring them from one place to another. It can rain in another place that might be arid without that rain. And so when you have this sort of water cycle going on, it's very conducive for life as we know it. Uh, and that's what makes Earth so wonderful for us. Uh, is this water cycle. So is that unique? Is, is that special? I don't know. Let's look at the other planets in the solar system. This is a standard kind of a diagram. The planets and the sun's sizes are to scale, but not the distances, which is a good thing. Um, if planets got this close, it would be bad. I, that's a technical term scientists use sometimes. Uh, when the Earth is torn to shreds and all life is evaporated, that would be bad. Um, when you look at the solar system this way, compressed in size, in scale at least, uh, distance scale, you can see that planets kind of fall into two groups. They're the inner four planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. We call them the terrestrial planets, which kind of means Earth-like. They're, they're basically rocky planets and small and warm. And then the outer gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, they're big and cold and gaseous. And you can subdivide these into a lot more groups. Um, planetary scientists don't call Uranus and Neptune gas giants. They tend to call them ice giants, but they don't mean ice literally. They mean certain molecules that are in the atmosphere, which they call ices, even though they're not solid. Science. Uh, we do like our jargon. Um, I'm going to call them gas giants. Uh, and you can see right away that these are two different groups. Gas giants are clearly different than the Earth. They are much larger. Jupiter is 10 times the diameter of Earth, 1,000 times the volume, 300 times the mass. It is mostly hydrogen and some helium. The Earth has very little hydrogen and very little helium. So right away, big difference. Earth is mostly solid. Well, depending on, on what you mean by mostly. I mean, it, there's, there's liquid underneath the surface, but it is a rocky metal planet, whereas Jupiter is mostly gas. So these are very, very different. So, okay, maybe Earth is special in that sense, that those four gas giants are very different. Well, let's look at the terrestrial planets. Mercury is tiny and airless and very, very hot. Uh, it is not like Earth much at all. Um, Mars is very small and much colder than Earth with a thin atmosphere, and it's not terribly Earth-like. And Venus, oh, you know, on paper, Venus is roughly the same size as the Earth, roughly the same mass as the Earth, roughly made up of the same stuff as Earth. On the other hand, uh, its atmosphere is so thick with a runaway greenhouse effect that it's the hottest planet in the solar system. It's hotter than Mercury, even though it's farther from the sun. Um, lead would melt on the surface of Venus. If you could stand on the surface of Venus, 
Um, I'm not sure what would kill you first. Um, it, the temperature, the pressure, it's like being under almost uh, half a mile of water on, under the ocean. That's how much air is, is on Venus. It's so thick. Uh, it also is poisonous. It's mostly carbon dioxide. Um, there are sulfur or sulfuric acid clouds. So yeah, sure, on paper, Venus is a little bit like Earth, but really, realistically, it's, it's Earth's evil twin, uh, and it's not Earth-like at all. So in the solar system, yeah, I, you know, the Earth's, Earth's kind of special. Um, but the thing is, the solar system is not the only system of planets we know about. And uh, since 1991, the first planets were discovered orbiting um, a weird kind of star, uh, the core of a massive star, this massive star blew up as a supernova, exploded. The core of the star collapsed down, and so you have something that's, that's literally twice the mass of the sun, but it, it's, it's only about, about 10, 12, 15 miles across. It's incredibly dense, blasting out radiation. The planets that are orbiting it are, are gonna be terrible places to live. Uh, you wouldn't wanna go there. So these are very, very different planets on Earth. A few years later, in 1995, we started finding planets around stars like the sun. And that was a very exciting moment. It, we knew for sure and for real these planets existed. Um, speculated about this for centuries. People have, have wondered if there were other planets around other stars. And the answer definitively now is yes. And in fact, we have found so many looking at just relatively nearby stars, depending on the methods, and I'll get into that in a moment, um, but given how many stars we've looked at for planets and how many we found and the way we find them, statistically speaking, um, something like, very roughly speaking, one out of every 10 stars maybe has planets, maybe one out of every five. The statistics are a little rough, um, but stars tend to have multiple planets, just like the sun does. And when you do the math, it kind of looks like there are more planets in the galaxy than stars. And there are hundreds of billions of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Hundreds of billions of planets. And right away you say, oh, hundreds of billions. That makes the Earth not seem quite so unique. Just statistically speaking, it seems like we're going to find another Earth. So let's see. The question is, um, first of all, pardon me, I'm from Colorado, where 10% humidity is like, oh, it's muggy today. And here I am in Chicago and my throat's all dry. Sorry about that. Um, there are a lot of ways of finding these planets. Um, in, in hindsight, I just want to say, what took you guys so long? I mean, seriously, they're everywhere, and you can find some of these methods would work with the kind of telescope you can order from the back of a magazine. You can walk into a store and buy one of these things and, and point it at a star where you know you have planets and actually detect them. Um, and it turns out, yeah, but it, at first it was really hard. But you know, once, then once you know something is there, you, and you can find it. It's much easier to look for something where you know where it is. Um, but this took a long time. Um, the most successful method, this is not the first method to find planets, but the most successful method is called the transit method. And basically, if the planet is orbiting the star, and planets orbit stars in ellipses or circles or something like that, if we happen to see that orbit edge on, then once every orbit, it passes directly in front of that star. It's a mini eclipse. We call that a transit. And it blocks a little bit of the starlight. And so if we sit there and measure the star's light, you know, all the time, measure, measure, measure. When the planet passes in front, we see a little bit of a dip in that starlight. And this animation will show you that. And here's a planet swinging around a star. And as soon as it passes in front of the planet, we see a dip in the, or passes in front of the star, we see a dip in the star's brightness. This is typically a very small dip. Um, a star like the sun and a planet like Jupiter, you see a 1% drop in the starlight. A planet like the Earth, you would see 1 10,000th of uh, uh, a percent, 1%, a 10,000, no, a hundredth of a percent uh, dip in the starlight. I think that's right. Um, it's a very, very tiny dip. Somebody's nodding their head. I assume you're an astronomer, so I'll say, I'm right. There we go. That's, uh, that's peer review right there. Um, so yeah, so it's a hundredth of a percent. That is a very, very, very tiny dip. Um, and a lot of the times, you, you can't measure the star's brightness that accurately, so you get a lot, of, a lot of scatter, a lot of noise in that measurement. But a lot of the times, you can see this dip very clearly. Uh, and the bigger the planet relative to the star, the clearer that dip is. You're blocking more of the star's light, and so you can see that a lot more clearly. Um, and it turns out, yeah, a 1% drop in starlight is measurable using a backyard telescope and a camera. 
Uh, and uh, a, lot of, a, lot of astro a lot of amateur astronomers have done this measurement. It's pretty amazing. Um, this method works so well that once it was established that we could see planets this way, NASA said, yeah, let's throw some hundreds of millions of bucks at this and started launching uh, observatories into space where you can really, really get a clear shot of the star. There's no atmosphere in your way making things harder to do. And this is the most successful method we have so far. Um, so um, this is a little diagram, a little 8-bit diagram there on the right showing you if a planet is orbiting a star and you can see it edge on that it's blocking the star. But in fact, um, there's another effect going on here. If you have a star and a planet and the planet's going around the star, well, the, the, the planet's orbiting the star because the star has gravity, but the planet has gravity too. And so it's not really that the planets going around the stars, that they're both orbiting their center of mass. And you're probably familiar with this concept. You've ever been on a teeter-totter or a seesaw or whatever you say out here in the Midwest? Um, it's like, you know, Coke or soda. I can never get that straight depending on where you are. Um, if, if, you're, if you have like two kids on a seesaw and they're, they're, they have the same weight, then you can put that, the, the, the fulcrum, the, the balance, right in the middle. But if one is bigger than the other one, you have to move that balance over a little bit to get them to, to, to be even. And it's the same thing here. If I were to like have a heavy weight in front of me and start swinging it around, it would be going around me, but I would be making a little circle as well as it goes around. And this is called a reflex velocity. Um, some people also call it a radial velocity. It's a, it's a very similar... Uh, effect and it has the same initials. So whenever anybody says RV, I think, well, which one are you talking about? Doesn't matter. It's the same thing. Um, now, if you have a massive planet and a low mass star, that star is kind of making a big circle. Uh, that is extremely hard to see that physically on the sky. It's been done for some nearby stars that you can actually see the star kind of wiggling in the sky, um, but that's an extremely small circle and stars are extremely far away. So it's very tiny on the sky and it's very difficult to measure. But we can use the Doppler effect. And you know the Doppler effect. When a motorcycle goes by and it goes the pitch of the motor is constant. If you're on the motorcycle, you just hear But as it's coming towards you, the pitch goes up. And when it gets past you, the pitch goes down. And this is a fairly complicated physics effect, but it's called the Doppler shift. And it works for light as well. If an object is moving towards you, the wavelength of the light gets shortened, and we call that blue shifting. And if it's moving away from you, the wavelength gets longer, and that's red shifting. And I know that's complicated, but again, think of sound. As the motorcycle heads towards you, the, the wavelengths get shortened, and that's what we hear as a higher pitch. And when it passes you, wavelengths get stretched out. We hear that as a lower pitch. Same thing with light. And it turns out that if you measure stars extremely carefully, and it's a complicated observation, you can actually see this. You can see the red and blue shift of the star's light as the planet is orbiting it. This is an extremely painstaking observation, but this is how the first planets were discovered, was with this reflex velocity method. Um, it was so difficult to do, uh, and the observations were, <laughs> were very, uh, when you look at the, the papers that were published and you're like, well, yeah, I see it, maybe, kind of, that a lot of astronomers were skeptical, as they should be with a new type of way of finding an object that we had never seen before. Uh, and so a lot of astronomers like, this could be a lot of different things, folks. Come on, let's, let's have a care here. And as time goes, went on, they were saying, well, here's one thing it could be. And it's like, well, no, it turns out no. And here's another thing it could be, well, no. And then somebody said, you know, if these planets are orbiting their stars edge on, they're going to transit the star and we're going to see a dip in the starlight. And they said, hey, hey, this star here, we know the planet's period well enough. We can predict when the starlight's going to dip. So let's look at it. And astronomers looked at it and the star like dipped at the predicted time. And it was like overnight. Everybody was like, oh, oh yeah, these are planets. And that was awesome. That was a good day. And she's nodding again, so I'm doing fine. Um, oh my, am I embarrassing you? Why don't you stand up and, uh, no, no. <laughs> oh gosh, I love giving in-person talks. It's more interactive. Um, 
So yeah, this, is, uh, this was a big deal. And at that point, everybody was like, yeah, we can now use the transit method. Now, you don't find every planet that way because not every planet's orbit is edge on. They could be like this or this or whatever. And you can only see them when they're edge on. So you're only actually seeing a fraction of the planets that are out there. But even then, we were finding hundreds of these things. And so um, NASA launched the Kepler mission, which, uh, which stared at one spot in the sky, looked at 150,000 stars, and found a lot of planets that way. And then they launched TESS, which is the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. I always have to think that carefully. There are a lot of satellites that have similar names, and, and, but the S's mean something different. This is a survey satellite, looks over the whole sky, and um, is searching for planets around some of the brighter stars that are typically closer to us. So it's surveying planets that are relatively close to us in the galaxy. And it's been hugely successful. The vast number of planets that we found have been found using the transit uh, method and the reflex velocity method. These are fantastic methods. They're not my favorite. Um, my favorite is when you take a picture of a planet and you can point at it and say, oh, there's the planet in our picture. Now this is super hard to do. Stars are bright and planets are not. Uh, and so it's like trying to see a lightning bug sitting on the edge of a spotlight, right? You've got this tremendously bright object and a tremendously dim one right next to it. But um, our, our techniques got really good over the past few years at sort of dimming the star's light in various ways so that the planet can be seen. Um, Beta Pictoris is a star in the southern hemisphere, a naked eye star, uh, and it's been known to have um, uh, an environment where planets can form around it. And so uh, this was a perfect uh, star to look at using this technique. And in the upper left, you can see a picture from December 2003 and um, the star is in the middle, it's, it's indicated there, and basically the star's light has been dimmed artificially using various techniques uh, um, as it was observed. And the, the planet just kind of pops out. That is Beta Pictoris B. Um, we name planets in alphabetical order of discovery with a lowercase letter, but we start at B for reasons. Um, and so uh, this was seen in November 2003, and then in October 2009, um, you can see uh, on the upper right that the star again is masked out. You can see where the planet was in 2003, but it's not there anymore. It's on the other side of the star. Uh, and yeah, yeah, you wait long enough and planets orbit their stars and you can see that movement in your images. So this planet um, orbits Beta Pic, um, as, as those in the know call it, uh, about uh, the same distance Saturn is from the sun. Um, it, it orbits a little bit faster because Beta Pictoris is a more massive star. But the point is, wait a, wait a little while, take another picture, and you can see the movement of this planet and confirm that it's actually a planet, not like a background star or a galaxy or something like that. So that, that's, that's kind of mind-blowing. Um, but that's nothing compared to HR 8799. Again, I don't make the rules. This is how we name stars. Bunch of different catalogs with a bunch of different ways of naming stars. But HR 8799. Um, is a young star with these giant planets orbiting it, and you can again see them in this image, um, B, C, and D, which were uh, discovered, I think B was discovered, and then C and D later, I can never remember which order, or, or how, we, they're, they're named in order of discovery, but it's hard to remember exactly when they were named, or when they were discovered, and let me tell you something, what a place to be in, where it's like, yeah, oh, that planet, I, I, I remember reading about it, but I can't even remember anything about it. It's like, we have so many planets now, <laughs> that it's hard to keep them all straight. And that's, yeah, that's cool. Uh, that, I, I love that. But this, this is a neat one because these planets orbit the star on time scales where we can actually um, see them move. And in fact, we can make a movie of their motion. Check that out. Lower left there is the time and you can see it going oops, over a few years. And you can see that there are four planets, B, C, D, and E, uh, and you can see them moving around the star with time. If I click that, does it go again? Doop, doop, doop. Let me hit the play button. How about that? There you go. Just do it one more time. Yeah, we can take movies of planets orbiting other stars. Uh, that's, yeah, again, um, being an astronomer is awesome. And we can do this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, direct imaging is this, is this wonderful method where you can actually see the planets in your images. Um, it works best in the infrared for various reasons, and that means it's better to look at young stars because the planets are still hot 
from formation, and that means they give off a lot of infrared light, you know, heat. And, and so you're kind of limited in the kinds of planets you can see. They have to be around nearby stars. Uh, they have to be young, they have to be big planets, da, 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 da. but the thing is, we've still been able to directly image um, over a dozen planets like this. I'm not even sure what the exact number is anymore. Um, and that's cool, because as, as someone who spent a lot of time at the eyepiece of a telescope when I was a kid, the idea of looking and seeing planets around other stars uh, is, is Star Trek to me. Um, so this, that's, this is phenomenal. Um, so, we have observed a lot of these planets, and what are we seeing? with a lot of these planets. Well, the thing is, these methods detect different kinds of planets. Um, the imaging technique, they have to be young and big, like Jupiter, or even more massive than that. The reflex velocity one works better for planets that are close into their star. The transit method works kind of, kind of well for planets out to a certain distance, but if they get too far out, the alignment has to be exactly right for you to see the transit. Um, but even with these limitations, when you have enough planets, you can start to see trends. Uh, and we can, start to start, we can start thinking about what it means, how far out the planet orbits from its star. And we have this notion called the habitable zone, which is the distance from a star, a planet can be sort of a notional distance, kind of a rough idea, where there could be liquid water on the surface. If it's too close, it's going to be way too hot. If it's too far away, it's going to be way too cold. And if it's in this habitable zone, it's going to be just right. A lot of people call this the Goldilocks zone for that reason, right? Not too hot, not too cold, just right. Um, it feels like colonialism to me. Um, it should be called the baby bear zone, right? Um, little girl's out in the woods and she sees this house and goes, this is going to be my house now, and, and sleeps in her bed and eats her food and we name it after her? Come on. Um, so it should be the baby bear zone. But to, get to, to avoid all that, habitable zone, just avoid the problem. Um, and it's not... Hard and firm rule. Um, the habitable zone around the sun is quite wide. Mercury is too close in. But Venus is on the inner edge, and Venus is a hellhole because of its atmosphere. It has so much carbon dioxide in its atmosphere that the greenhouse effect has made it super hot. Mars, uh, also technically in the habitable zone, but it has a very thin atmosphere that cannot hold in the heat, and so it's really, really cold. Um, so the habitable zone is sort of a minimum requirement, but you need to know a lot more about the planet if you're going to figure out if it's habitable or not. Um, but it, that's hard to do. Uh, we don't really, we, we're, we're just getting to the point now where we can start sort of tasting the atmospheres of some of these planets in various ways and looking at them and, and figuring out, it's like, oh, this one has a hydrogen atmosphere and this one is mostly helium or whatever. Um, we do not have the ability just yet to, to find a planet that's in the habitable zone, measure its atmosphere if it's small like the Earth, and see if it's Earth-like. So we just don't know. But we can ask, are there planets in other stars' habitable zones? Well, before you do that, you have to know what that means. Well, for a hot star, you kind of have to be farther out. And, you know, stars are at different temperatures. The sun is sort of a, a midland hot star. There are stars that are much hotter and stars that are much cooler. If a star is much hotter, you have to be farther away for it, the planet to be cool enough to have liquid water on the surface. So, and, and it turns out when you do the math, its habitable zone starts farther out but extends for a really, really long way. And for cooler stars, red dwarfs, for example, um, the, you have to be much, much closer to them to get warm enough to have liquid water on your surface. And the habitable zone is very thin. So if you move out a little bit from that star, it gets too cold. Um, so to find planets in a habitable zone around a red star, a red dwarf star, um, that would be interesting because the habitable zone is so thin. Well, what have we found? Well, um, this is a, uh, an example. Um, we actually, this is from a few years ago. We actually know a lot more. If I were to actually plot how many we, we, we know like this, they'd, they'd all be really tiny and stacked up. Um, G stars, are, we have names for the letter, letter designations for different kinds of stars. The sun is a G star. Um, and for example, there is a star called Kepler 452, um, one of the stars that the Kepler Space Telescope looked at. And it found a planet orbiting that star uh, in the star's habitable zone. And that's Kepler 452b. There are K stars, which are 
orange dwarfs. They're a little bit cooler than the sun. And you can see there's a, these, these are just drawings representative of a bunch of planets that have been found in the habitable zones of, of their stars, Kepler 442, 155, 235, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are M stars, these red dwarfs. And yeah, we have found uh, habitable, uh, we found planets in their habitable zones as well. These are not gas giant planets. We found lots of gas giants. I just didn't show them here. I'm just showing ones that are more like the Earth. If you look at these, you'll notice that these are drawn to scale. As far as we know, um, this is the relative size of these planets, not the stars, just the planets relative to Earth. And if you look at them, you'll notice that they're all a little bit bigger than the Earth. And we call these super Earths. Um, these, these are planets that are up to roughly twice the diameter of the Earth. And I'll get to that in a sec. Um, but the point is, we are finding terrestrial Earth roughly sized planets. Um, some people say you should use Venus sized because we don't know what these planets are like. And if you call them Earth sized, you know, the, the journalists are going to say Earth like planet found. It's like we don't know if it's Earth like, we just know it's our size. And it could be very different. Um, and I like the idea of using Venus sized planets because that, that right away keeps you from thinking that. Um, but the point is, we're finding these planets around these stars. And uh, in fact, there's a, a, a nearby red dwarf called Trappist-1, which has seven, seven Earth-sized planets orbiting it, three of which are in its habitable zone. Seven Earth-like, and they're so close in that they, if you put the Trappist-1 system, if you replace the sun with the Trappist-1 system, all seven of those planets would orbit inside Mercury's orbit. These are very tightly, tightly uh, uh, configured planets. Very cool. Um, just an example of a handful of habitable zone planets we found. Again, this is artwork. And again, you can see these are all bigger than Earth. These are all super Earths. We have no idea what these are like. These drawings are completely an artist's imagination. Um, so we don't know what they're actually like, but it's just to give you an idea of the sizes of these planets. Um, they, they are all bigger than the Earth. Okay. Well, what kind of planets are we finding then, right? This is, I'm just showing you these. The first planets found around sun-like stars were, were Jupiter-sized planets. Uh, and and that's, those are the easiest ones to find. It's just they're big and they're easy to see. How, you know, how many of those are we finding compared to how many planets the size of the Earth are we finding? Um, and this is a, a little bit of an older graph. Um, we, we've discovered like 1,500 or 2,000 more planets since this graph was made. But overall, it's, it's the same shape, which is the important thing. This is the only math <laughs> in this talk, the only graph you have to look at. Um, happily, this is not too hard to interpret. Um, it's just a bar graph. The more planets we found, the higher the bar. And from left to right is size. So on the left, small planets like Mars, or Mercury, say, would be in that first bin, and we haven't found very many of those. Well, does that mean there aren't many of those out there? Not necessarily, it's just they're small, they're hard to see. The transit method, they only block a teeny, teeny bit of sunlight, and so it's, they're very hard to detect. Um, they don't have much gravity, so they don't pull on their star very hard, so it's hard to use the reflex velocity to measure them. So they're just difficult to find. Um, we do find a few. So this, this, this bar graph being so short is misleading. There's probably more of those. Um, we are incomplete, we say, uh, in, in that size. The next one is Earth-sized planets, and you can see we found more of those. And then the next two are, are super-Earths and mini-Neptunes. In our solar system, there's a huge size gap. Earth is the biggest terrestrial planet. Neptune is the smallest gas giant. There's nothing in between, and Neptune's like four times wider than the Earth, something like that. There's no planet in our solar system that we know of that's twice the diameter of the Earth. And yet, in this graph, this is showing you there are lots of these planets orbiting other stars. And they're, they're, as you get bigger, they're easier to see. But then you, you look and you say, well, what about the Neptune size, Saturn size, Jupiter size? There's a sudden drop in those numbers. And those planets we can see really easily. If a star has a Jupiter-sized planet, and it transits, we're going to see it. Uh, if it, depending on certain caveats, I can see you. Give, well, it depends on how close it is and if it's angled right. I know, I know, I know. But the point is, it's much easier in a, in a system to find a Jupiter-sized planet than an Earth-sized planet. So the fact that there are fewer of those Jupiters than those super Earths and mini Neptunes is telling you that super Earths and mini Neptunes are really common in the universe. Pl stars really like making planets that size. And there's nothing like that in our solar system. We don't know. There may be a ninth planet 
if I can call it the ninth planet. Um, if you like Pluto, we can talk. Um, we can argue, actually. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be clear about that. But there may be another planet out there way out past Neptune, and it may be like a mini Neptune. We don't know. Um, and if, it's even, if it even exists. But the point is, we don't see anything like that in our solar system now. And when we look out at stars, they're everywhere. They're like the most common planet in the universe. And then I can say to you, ah, that brings me back to my original question. Is Earth special? And it turns out that the most common kind of planet out there, we don't even have in our solar system. And that makes me think, well, Earth is kind of special. Because if you were to look at a thousand solar systems, the majority of them are going to have these kinds of planets when ours doesn't. It kind of makes our solar system special. We don't know why. Um, it may be there's one idea that there may have been planets like this in our solar system early on, and they collided and destroyed themselves, and the debris is what Earth formed from. Um, I like this idea. Uh, it's neat. I don't know if it's right. It may not be. Um, but it would explain things. It, you know, it, why don't we have the most common kind of planet in the galaxy? It would explain that. Um, we don't know. But in this, when you look at this graph, it kind of does make Earth look a little bit more special. Um, however, was Goldilocks too picky? Well, you know, duh, yes. Um, when we're thinking about Earth-like planets, do we really have to be in the habitable zone for there to be liquid water? And you can say, look, I've watched Star Trek. There are silicon-based life forms out there. They don't have to be based on carbon. They don't need water. And it's like, well, maybe. But on Earth, everything uses water. And we know that water is a good medium for life to originate in, for the reasons I said earlier. And so liquid water is kind of the place to look. You know, I don't, I don't want to start looking for things that may or may not be right when we know water works. So let's look for liquid water on other planets. Um, and if you're not in the habitable zone, is it possible to still have liquid water? And if you would ask that question in the 1960s, the answer would have been no. Um, but it turns out the answer we now know is yes. And it turns out you don't even have to be a planet, you can be a moon. This is a, a, an image of uh, Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system, and you can see two of its moons. Uh, the one just to the right of center, I believe, is Io, which is volcanic and horrible. Uh, I mean, it's a really cool moon, but it's not a good place to live. Uh, on the lower left is Europa. And Europa is an icy moon. Uh, we know this, it, it, when images of it, you can see it's very reflective, like ice, and we've actually sent probes to Jupiter and seen it up close. And it turns out that Europa, uh, up close, I love this picture, um, may have, uh, well, I should, may, uh, we know, we know, uh, between you and me. It has a, an ocean of liquid water under its surface. It's very cold out by Jupiter. Uh, water is frozen solid enough to be like granite. Uh, it's so hard. But under the surface of Europa, it's liquid. And that's because as Europa orbits Jupiter, Jupiter's gravity squeezes and extends the moon back and forth, making it like, like uh, extends it and compresses it, extends it and compresses it, and that heats it up. It creates friction inside the moon, warms up the core of the moon, and that ice is melted. So there's a thick ice shell. We don't know how thick. It's probably many, many miles deep. A liquid ocean under that, and then a rocky core. Uh, so there's liquid water under Europa. And, okay, does that mean it's habitable? Eh, we don't know. On the other hand, there's this idea that the core of Europa is rocky. It's hot. Um, there could be cracks in the surface of it. So, so basically, where the core meets the ocean, the, the, the ocean floor, could have cracks that has chemicals spewing out and heat. We see this on Earth. These fumaroles, these black smokers, there are a lot of different names for these vents. Cracks in the ocean surface, or in the ocean floor, that are volcanic, basically, spewing out chemicals that are toxic to us, but there's plenty of life that can live on them. The water's warmer, there's nutrients in that water, and life has, ero has evolved, basically, to survive there. So, technically speaking, if that's happening on Europa, not only could it be habitable, it might be inhabited. There could be little alien fishies swimming underneath the surface of Europa. We don't know. Um, we may know after we send probes there. That would be very exciting. Um, the point here is that Jupiter is well outside the sun's habitable zone, and yet it still has a world orbiting it that has uh, an ocean of water underneath the surface. And in fact, the amount of water we think under Europa's surface is more than all the oceans of Earth combined. So Europa has more water than we do, and we have life. Interesting. Um, 
Saturn's moon Enceladus, also an icy moon, uh, small, not very big, um, but again, it has liquid water under its surface. We know that. If you look at the bottom there, you can see those sort of four parallel dark blue lines. Those are cracks in the surface that spew out liquid water. This was discovered by the Cassini spacecraft, which orbited Saturn for 13 years. And it was, it was looking at Enceladus and turned around. Um, it, was, you know, it flew past Enceladus, turned around, and looked with the sort of the sun on the other side of the moon backlighting it and saw this. And it turns out this is, these are geysers, this is old faithful, cold faithful, water spewing up into space um, from the underwater or the undersurface ocean on Enceladus. And in fact, Cassini flew through those plumes and was able to sample the material that it found. And it, and, and it found organic compounds. And the organic just means carbon-based, complex carbon-based molecules that don't necessarily mean life, but it, you know, it's kind of what life's based on. So there could be alien fishies swimming under the surface of Enceladus. We don't know. Um, but conditions there, again, not bad for life. And Saturn, much farther than Jupiter. It's very cold there. So again, let's not let the habitable zone constrain our thinking too much. Um, so that's two moons of outer worlds. Are there more objects like that out there? And it turns out, yeah, a handful. There's, you know, Rhea orbiting Saturn, Titania around Uranus, uh, or Uranus, I'm sorry. Um, I, was, I was thinking Oberon and I mispronounced Uranus. Um, astronomers tend to pronounce it Uranus. Um, Greek astronomers say Uranus, which is how it really should be pronounced. It's a Greek word. Um, and, you know, we, we started calling it Uranus because really, honestly, sick of the jokes, sick of them. Uh, the last funny Uranus joke was made in Futurama TV show many years ago. I, I, you can find that online. It was very funny. I won't repeat it here. Um, and I, I said, all right, I'll call it Uranus. And then it occurred to me, this is no better because it's like if you walk into a bathroom that's not cleaned very well and you go, hmm, smells Uranus. Uh, it's, yeah, so you're just replacing one bodily excretion with another. What are you going to do? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I just go with Uranus, and as long as I don't tell you, you wouldn't know. Um, but anyway, um, at Triton is a large moon of Neptune. Uh, there's also these, these smaller icy worlds out past Neptune. It's Eris and Sedna. We don't have very good images of them because they're small and really far away. But there is some evidence that all of these objects have liquid water under their surfaces, including one you may be familiar with, and that's Pluto. Um, this, that that heart-shaped region uh, called Sputnik Planitia, the left-hand side of it, the left-hand side of that heart called Tomba Regio, named after Clyde Tomba, who discovered Pluto in 1930. Um, that is a plane of liquid nitrogen, excuse me, it's sort of frozen slushy nitrogen, but there's some evidence that it's warmed by water underneath it, liquid water. So it's entirely possible that Pluto, Pluto has a subsurface ocean. Pluto's tiny and very cold. If it has water under its surface, liquid water, it could be anywhere. The habitable zone is not just limiting, it may be in the minority of places to look for water under, uh, for, for, for water on worlds. So um, we really have to not let our thinking be too constrained. So that brings me back, is Earth special? Well, why is Earth special in the solar system? Well, up until recently, it was the only planet that had liquid water. Yeah, guess what? Now we're finding that we're vastly outnumbered by moons of these gas giants. Uh, and so in that case, Earth is not special at all. Now, we have water on our surface, but who cares? Uh, we can see the stars. Maybe they can't, okay. Um, but still, there may, there, there may be liquid water there. So Earth is not special in that sense. Is water the only thing that's good for life? How about liquid methane? Um, Titan is a gigantic moon of Saturn, second largest uh, moon in the solar system, about as big as Mercury. If Saturn weren't there, we would be tempted to call Titan a planet. Um, it has an atmosphere that is mostly nitrogen, just like Earth's, much colder. Um, when Cassini passed over this, a spacecraft, and used radar to penetrate that thick atmosphere, it's opaque, you can see that picture of it uh, with Saturn, it's kind of this orange fuzzy ball, you can't see through it, the, the haze is so thick. Radar, though, goes right through it. And if you beam radar down to the planet, let it bounce back up, you can make a map of the planet. And near um, the North Pole, it found a lot of these features like this, shown here, um, where the radar wasn't being reflected. Well, rock, ice, metal, that all reflects radar. What does not reflect radar? Liquid. 
And yeah, that's a lake. Well, it can't be water. It's way too cold on Titan. And so, yeah, it's actually methane and ethane, what we would call natural gas here on Earth because we're warmer, is a liquid on, on Titan. Not only that, but Titan, um, you can look around the edges of that lake and you can see what looked like rivers flowing into it. It's like, yeah, those are hills to the lower, the lower part. There are hills up there. And what's happening is methane evaporates from the lake, blows over to those hills, precipitates down, rain, right, and then flows in these rivers back to the lake. And if that sounds familiar, that's because that's the water cycle here on Earth that life depends on, except on Titan, it's methane. Um, and carbon is the key element for life on Earth, and methane is made of carbon, carbon and hydrogen. So there's plenty of carbon on, on Titan, and there's also uh, a, a liquid cycle, like, on Earth. Whoa. Are, are there alien fishies on Titan? We don't know. Um, I would advocate that we go there and find out, uh, and we are. We're sending. We're sending probe. We're going to be sending a probe to Titan in the next few years. Actually, it takes a long time to get there. Um, but the point is, again, is Earth special because we have water? Maybe not. Maybe we need to broaden our, our our viewpoint a little bit. Earth has water now. I live in Colorado. Ask me again in ten years. Um, but Earth has water now. Uh, in the past, it didn't. It, it, there wasn't a, it, the, 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 the amount of water on the surface has changed. Is it possible that other planets in our solar system look different in the past? Well, Mars, on the outside of the habitable zone, pretty cold, small, thin atmosphere. We know there's ice on it. The polar caps are mostly water ice. We've, uh, we've seen lots of ice under the surface of Mars in various places. So we know there's plenty of water on it, but it's all frozen because it's cold. What about in the distant past? And it turns out as we've sent more probes to Mars, uh, in fact, the latest rover Pers Perseverance landed in a crater, uh, Jezero crater, or Jezero, again, pronunciation, um, that we were pretty sure was an ancient lake. And yeah, it turns out it, 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 a recent result, and by recent I mean like two days ago, they announced this paper going, yeah, uh, we have now proof. We were pretty sure before, now we're absolutely sure. This was a standing lake, uh, this gigantic crater 90 miles across, somewhere, something like that, had, was filled with water. And there was water flowing in and water flowing out of it, um, which means there was standing on water on Mars. Well, you can't do that with a thin atmosphere. Um, so that means that the water, it must have been um, a thicker atmosphere on Mars a long time ago, uh, billions of years ago. And it must have been warmer. Mars may have looked like this. And that, to me, looks like Earth. I mean, that's a drawing. But still, um, there's, some, there's evident, tons of evidence of riverbeds on Mars, lakes, some evidence of an ocean. Um, not the best evidence, in my opinion. It's interesting, and it may be true. Um, but either way, there was standing water on Mars uh, you know, three billion years ago. And then something happened, and it's up to debate what exactly happened. A lot of different ideas, but it lost its water uh, and its atmosphere. Its atmosphere started going away, and then the water basically boiled off. Um, water boils at very low temperatures if the atmosphere is very thin. And now Mars is frozen and, and fairly dead today. But a long time ago it wasn't. It was Earth-like before Earth was Earth-like, as we think of it now. So we shouldn't be constrained in time either. Um, we don't know if there's life in the universe. Um, even if there was, there was life on Mars billions of years ago and it went extinct, that is still a massive, massive discovery. Uh, it, if that turns out to be the case, it'll be one of the biggest discoveries of science uh, in all of history. Uh, that's really amazing, so I'm hoping. And, and per Perseverance is actually looking for fossils. It's going, to, it's going to be looking for things like microbial mats, which are like, like a algae that is fossilized in a sense. Um, and if it can find, we see that in, in Earth's on, Earth lake beds and things like that. If it, if it finds that on Mars, yeah, that's a big deal as he says, as he pauses to drink water. Um, it's one of my favorite pictures of Earth, one of my favorite pictures of Earth, uh, over, the, over the edge of the moon taken by an Apollo crew. Um, uh, basically, you're seeing everybody on Earth except for three guys um, who, were, who were in the capsule at the time when this picture was taken. Um, this picture is great because look at Earth there. Look at that blue ocean and the white clouds. Uh, and the moon, which is barren and you know, no atmosphere. There's water on the moon, but it's, it's, it's hard to find. And, and the moon is lifeless. I, I have no doubt about that. Um, 
And it also shows the earth as a planet out in space, right? It's kind of a half full earth, and I love this. Um, it shows how small the earth is, how beautiful it is, but it shows that it's a planet, uh, and it's a world just like these other planets. And uh, except we do have this water. We do have life. Um, whoop, 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 whoop. There we go. This is my absolute favorite picture of Earth. This is taken by the Rosetta spacecraft sent by the European Space Agency to uh, land on a comet, which it did. You may have seen all those photos of 67P churyumov gerasimenko Just rolls off the tongue. Um, this comet that orbits the sun, and, and uh, Rosetta went there and studied it. But it had to pass by Earth a couple of times to be able to, to get there. And it took this picture of Earth, and you see it as a crescent Earth. You know, you're used to seeing a crescent moon, or if you know a little bit more, a crescent Venus through a telescope. But to see a crescent Earth, that's weird. You don't see that. You usually see it as a full disk or a globe. And this, to me, shows Earth as a planet, except it's that blue and white crescent. It's that water, liquid water and water vapor. And when I look at this and I think, you know, we're so lucky to have not lost our atmosphere like Mars, or not to have too much like Venus, or not to be huge like Jupiter, or not to have an ice shell above us 20 miles thick so that we can see the stars, or be orbiting too close or too far from a red dwarf, or a giant star, or, or, or. The conditions for Earth exist everywhere. We're not made of anything special. Iron, silicon, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, that exists everywhere in the universe. There are stars like the sun everywhere in the universe. You don't even have to have a star like the sun. M dwarfs, it turns out, these, these red dwarfs, I, I should have mentioned earlier, most common star in the galaxy. And they have planets, which means planets around M dwarfs are probably more common than planets around stars like the sun. And they're going to be, they're more likely to be Earth-sized. Um, it's easier for stars like that to make planets like Earth. So when I ask again the question, is Earth special? And I answered it, and I said, no, maybe, yes. It depends on what you're asking. Right? It's, is it special in the solar system? Yes, but no. There are other things like it. Is it special in the universe? Yes, but no. There are other planets probably like that. But is it special And when I, to us? And when I look at this picture, and I think, right atmosphere, right water, we've evolved to, to, to adapt to the way the Earth is. But even so... It's our planet, it's our home, and it's our time. A billion years ago it was different. 50 years from now it might be different. Right now, it's Earth, it's home, that's us. And is it special? Yes, it is. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, you want special? I ended on time. That's special. Um, <laughs> Wow, that almost never happens. Okay, so we can have Q&A for the next, what, five hours? Is that what I was told? Yeah. Um, we have microphone there and a microphone there for people who want to come up. Mind your spacing. Um, and we're, we're actually, this call, this, uh, the talk is on Zoom for people who are virtual. Um, so if you have a question, please come up and use the mic so they can hear you. And we'll take questions from you guys and from Zoom people, which I will be told about. So if you have a question, can you come up to the mic, please? Are those, are those pictures of the outer moons artificially brightened to see the detail? Because when you see the picture of the sun from those our satellites out there, the sun is a little tiny speck. <laughs> That's a good question. The answer to that is yes, no, maybe, it depends. Um, boy, am I a scientist. Um, the, an the answer to your question is yes, right? If, if you go out to, say, Pluto, the sun is, is um, as little as uh, one twenty-five hundredth as bright as the sun is from the Earth. It's very, very dim. It's about as bright. It's, it's brighter than the full moon, but it's, it's much dimmer than it is now. So if you're going to take a picture of Pluto, you have to take a longer exposure. That's all. Um, so, the, so I wouldn't say the, the pictures, pictures are artificially brightened. I would just say if I were to take a picture of you right now, um, I would have to take a longer exposure because you're not as well lit as if we were outside on a sunny day. Um, a lot of the times in astronomy, we do uh, fiddle with the colors. 
Um, and and some, a, lot, a lot of the pictures you saw there are, are natural colors. They were taken with filters that mimic how we see with the human eye. A lot of the times we don't take pictures that way because we don't want to see things like we do with the human eye. We're trying to see them differently. Um, uh, and I, one of these days I got to write about that because it's a, it's a whole thing. It's, very, it's really interesting. It's complicated. But the answer, so the answer to your question is no, they're not artificially brightened, but yes, they're exposed in a way that makes them look brighter. Maybe. It's complicated. <laughs> yes, come on up. Um, so first of all, big fans are really excited to meet you in person. Um, my question was, uh, Europa and Enceladus don't have atmospheres, right? So how much radiation do we expect penetrates through the surface into the subsurface oceans? I'm getting a funny echo from this microphone. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Also, I think, I think I'm having sinus issues. Can you hear me better now? A little bit, yeah. Okay, yeah. So Europa and Enceladus, uh, they don't have atmospheres, right? Sure. Uh, yeah, so how much radiation do we expect penetrates the surface oh. into the subsurface oceans? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, actually, yeah, that did work better. Um, so the question is how much radiation is hitting the surfaces of these airless worlds? And the answer is a lot. Um, Europa, which orbits uh, Jupiter, um, it's always fun to try to figure out how much detail to give. Um, the, Jupiter uh, is a source of a lot of strong radiation. It's a very powerful magnetic field. And Europa is embedded in that field as it orbits Jupiter. And so the surface is getting pounded by subatomic particles, which is radiation, essentially. Um, and so the, if you were to stand on the surface of Europa, um, well, you'd be dead because it's really cold and there's no air. Um, but if you, even if you were in a spacesuit, the radiation would get you relatively quickly. It would not be good. There's a wonderful movie, uh, again, bringing this back to science fiction, called The Europa Report, um, in which a few of you are nodding your heads. Excellent. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's one of these found footage type of, type of movies where we send a mission to Europa, and some of the footage gets back. And they, at one point, they're on the surface, and they're worried that the scientist is going to get too much radiation exposure. And that movie is really accurate scientifically. They did a really good job, um, uh, science fiction. But in the end, yeah, there's a lot of radiation. Um, uh, but it, it doesn't penetrate the ice, really. So underneath that ice, is, if it's deep enough, certainly, yeah, that the, any, you know, if there's a fish swimming in the ocean of Europa, it probably wouldn't even know Jupiter exists. They might be able to infer it from other things. Um, but uh, yeah, the radiation wouldn't be a problem. And you want a little bit, sometimes, it, 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 you know, it can help. It's an energy source, and it, it, mutations help of evolution and that sort of thing. Usually, I mean, they can. They usually doesn't. I mean, mutations are usually bad. But sometimes they're beneficial because, you know, there used to be nothing but, but bacteria on Earth, and now here we are, and we're the result of an endless stream of mutations. So if you like humans, you like mutations. If you don't like humans, that's fine too, I guess. And I can certainly understand that viewpoint. Um, do we want to take a Zoom question? Do we have one? Yes. Yes. Uh, oh. So the first question is, for planets that we've discovered orbiting pulsars, do we think that they somehow survived the supernova of their host star, or could they have formed in the aftermath of the supernova? That is a solid question. Um, the first planets that we found, and I mentioned, were orbiting the remains of a star that had exploded. And it's got the mass of the sun, but it's compressed down into a little ball like 20 miles across, something like that. That's called a pulsar. Um, and it, it's in, it gives off an intense amount of radiation. Uh, it makes Jupiter look like nothing. Um, and so these planets are bathed in this radiation. But the thing is, if a star explodes, that's a fairly energetic event. Um, it, did it have planets before and they survived, or did they somehow form after? Um, and there's a lot of complicated physics that goes into this. Um, but typically, when the star explodes, it loses so much mass that its gravity drops a lot, and so it might lose any planets that it had. And the idea, we think, is that these planets formed from the leftover debris. So the star exploded, some of that debris was still hanging around, and it coalesced to form those planets. Um, but it, this is an idea, it's a hypothesis, we don't really know. But I think that's probably the best bet. At the, at the moment. Uh, so we did, we did one there. So we'll go back over here. Yes. 
So I saw a documentary that said... Uh-oh. <laughs> You've done your own research, you're saying? Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. Um, uh, that said that Jupiter prevents massive, uh, massive asteroids and other things from hitting the Earth. And, um, and that's part of the reason why we haven't seen a whole lot of like, life-threatening um, impact. And I'm wondering whether uh, you might consider that uh, Jupiter and uh, its presence to be part, uh, part its presence to be part of the um, kind of the fabric of life on Earth. Right. One of one of the things necessary. we need. Right. Yeah. Um, this is a this is a very popular idea that that basically Jupiter is so massive and has so much gravity that um, it actually, if any, any asteroids or mostly comets, uh, icy bodies that come from the outer solar system and, and could hit Earth, Jupiter basically tosses them out of the solar system or drops them into the sun or basically just protects the Earth. And it turns out that's complicated. Um, uh, there are a series of papers that have come out by a friend of mine, uh, Kevin Grazier, um, who was the science advisor for Battlestar Galactica, for example. I just, I just love bringing it back to science fiction if I can. Um, who studied this and showed that, um, yes, there are many comets that could come in and Jupiter would basically fling them away and protects us. But on the other hand, it also takes ones that would have missed us and aims them right at us. Um, that sucks. Uh, not to get too technical. Um, and it turns out that, uh, yeah, it depends on orbits, it depends on directions these things are coming in and all kinds of things. And it turns out it's kind of, kind of a wash that, yeah, Jupiter protects us from some, but it also aims others at us. So it's, it's, and it, this type of study is really hard to do, um, very nitpicky on your initial conditions, you know, what are you starting with and, and how you end, what, what you end up with is very touchy. Uh, you change things a little bit and you get wildly different results. So, um, it's not clear how this all works. And I, I know he, j he just wrote another paper and I haven't gone around to writing, uh, reading it yet. Um, so I, I would say that, that that's a popular idea. You hear about it a lot. I'm not convinced it's true. Um, and if you want to make a list of, of things that had to go right for the Earth, um, it's a long list. And you say, that, God, the odds of the Earth even existing. But it's like, what are the odds of you being here right now? Right? If it had rained instead of being sunny 20 years ago when you were out for a walk or something, things might have propagated out to where you wouldn't be here right now. There's, everything in life is contingent on something happening. Uh, and so you, just, it, it, you have to be careful and not think that you, you need all of these things to happen in a certain order, in a certain way, for things to turn out the way they did. It could be just much more general circumstances. Um, I'm hoping that's the case because if, if it's not, then, then Earth is very special and I don't want Earth to be that special. I want there to be a lot. I, I want a Star Trek future. I want, I want every planet to have, you know, aliens with things on their noses and, and speak English when we get there. <laughs> no, but I just, I, I mean, I just want there to be life everywhere because I think that would be awesome. Yes. Have we have been able to like scientifically prove like alien moons on other solar systems yet? And if not, like how likely is that to happen soon or in the general future? Me personally, no. Um, <laughs> that's easy to answer. Um, no, we, we have not been able to show that any other world anywhere has life on it, unless we brought it there. Uh, we found um, Staphylococcus on the moon um, but that was on uh, a lander <laughs> that, that had landed there, and they, they, Apollo 12 landed near it, brought pieces back, and they looked at it and went, yeah, that's, there's staff on this. Um, and it turns out it probably just wasn't sterilized very well when we sent it there. It's the only life that's ever been found on another world. Um, so Mars, no. You know, Europa, no. These other planets around other stars, we're nowhere near being able to see that yet. Um, but what we can say is that conditions for life on some of these other worlds are, you know, are possible. Mars was very Earth-like a long time ago. Did life evolve there? We don't know. But that's why we're looking. So that's why I'm saying that you know, this would be it. If we find life on Mars, then you know, one of the closest planets in the entire universe, uh, and it looks like it does now, uh, if we found life that existed billions of years ago, that would be huge because it shows that life can arise uh, anywhere, hopefully, or at least it hints at that, it implies that. Uh, so um, I'm hopeful, we'll see. 
And, you know, I, I've also watched Alien and Andromeda Strain, so um, that sometimes life isn't great. But I'm, I'm kind of hoping that, you know, if we do find life out there, and, and, and I should say, if we do find life, chances are it's going to be bacterial, you know, something like that. The, the idea of finding, I hate to use the word advanced or complex because these are, these are not great terms, but the idea of finding intelligence out there is much, much, much harder than finding very simple single-celled life. Okay, we can go to more, more Zoom? Yes. And uh, I can do this all night. Um, <laughs> I had Giordano's pizza for lunch, I may have mentioned, so I don't need to eat for like the next week. Um, so, hi, I'm in third grade, and I have read that there may be alien life in Venus's clouds. Do you think this is possible? Oh, hi, third grader. Um, when I was in third grade, I loved science. Oh my gosh, would I have loved to see a... Sometimes I like, when I put a talk together, I think, would, would I have wanted to see this when I was in third grade? Uh, and the answer is almost always no. Um, <laughs> Uh, this one, this one I would have. Um, yeah, so there was this idea that came out about a year ago that there was a chemical called phosphine, a very simple chemical, found in the atmosphere of Venus. And phosphine on Earth um, is very hard to make, except biologically. And it turns out there's this type of, these anaerobic bacteria, this type of bacteria that they don't breathe oxygen, um, they create phosphine as sort of a waste product. Um, and you find these on rotten logs and in decaying corpses and fun things like that. Um, and so when you find it on Venus, it, that's a little weird. And it's like, well, could this be made naturally, geologically? And it's like, well, it could be from volcanism. It could be from lightning. Uh, it, lightning changes chemistry and, and things like that. And the original author said, well, no, we don't think it's volcanoes because of this. We don't think it's lightning because of that. And we're kind of left with the, you know, maybe it's life. Well, um, some subsequent papers came out. Some people said, well, it turns out there's a lot of volcanism on Venus. That planet is covered in volcanoes. And it's possible that phosphine was generated by that and thrown up into the atmosphere. Uh, and then some other astronomers came out and said, yeah, maybe you didn't actually even detect phosphine in the first place. And I hate to be a, you know, a party pooper here, um, but uh, the idea that there's even phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus in the first place may be wrong. Um, there are fairly convincing papers that came out that said, the first, the, the way things, the way they calibrated their data, and there's this other stuff that looks like phosphine when you observe it that way. And so it may be that there's just not any phosphine there at all. Um, so that's too bad. And also a paper just came out recently saying that Venus may have never had water on its surface. We think a long time ago Venus might have been a much nicer place. Uh, and now this paper, which I've not read yet, so I can't say too much about, but they basically said, yeah, no, it was never a nice place to live. It's always been awful. Um, so I don't know. Venus may not be the best place to look. I still think Mars is the best. I just, well, Titan, Enceladus, and Europa are the best places to look, but they're really far away. Mars is a lot closer. Um, two more? Okay. Um, did you have one? Oh, okay. That's wow, social distancing. There's not even anybody at the microphone, and he's 10 feet back. That's great. Hi. Um, so my knowledge in biology is uh, not great, but I'll give this question a shot. So this idea that kind of came up a couple of times throughout the talk was, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it was basically like, I can, you know, collect a couple of fairly simple molecules, water, methane, and whatnot, and I can build life from that. Uh, um, if, I, if I remember correctly, that, that ex the experiment that like kind of brought this idea forward is uh, more or less kind of old now. It's like something like 50 or 60 years old. Yeah. And I was wondering if that idea, whether, you know, people in the field uh, have pretty much the same viewpoint of, like, I can build, I can put a couple of simple things together and I can start life, or is it more complicated, or is it just as the same picture kind of still hold? Right. Um, what you're talking about is the Yuri Miller experiment. Um, and when I was a kid, this was a big deal. They basically took a big jar and threw in a lot of stuff that they thought existed in the early Earth. So a lot of hydrogen and methane and stuff in the Earth's atmosphere back then, and then sparked it, ran sparks through it that was to imitate lightning. And the lightning, the, the sparks would change the chemistry of these things. And, and what they found was that um, there was a brown goo that was sort of coating the inside of this glass jar. And when they sampled it, it was, it was more complex carbon-based molecules, prebiotic, as they say. 
Um, now, I'm not a biologist because biology is what we call a squishy science. Um, but uh, I have talked to some scientists who have done that. The ex they, they don't think the experiment is that rigorous. I mean, it's not perfectly doing what the Earth did back then, and it was, but it wasn't really trying to do that. It was more of a proof of concept. It's like, we have this idea that you can take simple things and spark them and get more complicated things, and that worked. Uh, and in the, in the subsequent 60, 70 years since that, they've, they've done this experiment again in different ways, and they, they, they find that it still works. You can still create these more complex molecules from simple ones, and in fact, when you look at pictures of Europa, like that one I showed, and it had the red streaks all through it, um, and you look at Pluto, and these pictures of Pluto where it has red features on it, um, and a lot of Saturn's moons too, um, this, the, this type of chemical is called a tholin, and it's basically, um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a carbon-based molecule, and it, it can be different colors, brown, red, black, um, but basically what happens is methane, which is common everywhere, it's a very simple molecule, it's all over the solar system, Ultraviolet light from the sun hits it, breaks down the methane, builds itself back up into more complex stuff. And that nature is doing that experiment for us. That is in fact happening. So the basic concept of the Uri Miller experiment is, is correct. Um, I don't know how biologists feel about it now. You'd have to talk to a biologist. Um, but the idea that, yeah, you know, we, simple things build up to make more complicated things, yeah. And we find prebiotic organic material in meteorites, on comets, out in space, in gas clouds floating around in space, um, the sort of things that are like amino acids, which are, are you know, what the, your, your body uses as coding to build proteins. So, you know, life is based on these things, and we see them everywhere. So, yeah, something is out there making them. Let's hope it's not the protomolecule from the expanse. A few titters. Few giggles. Okay, that's fine. All right. Uh, yes. So I think this is the last one. Yeah. Uh, where's the last one? But there is one standing. Oh, okay. Sure. You've been waiting long enough. <laughs> so, so, so what you're saying is I shouldn't take 20 minutes to answer these questions as I typically do. <laughs> There's so many cool things to say. <laughs> okay. You look very excited. <laughs> Um, when you were talking about the habitable zone, so where we uh, discover exoplanets on single star systems, is there a possibility that habitable zones can exist in binary star systems, if we could find exoplanets there? Yes. Um, so can we find exoplanets in binary stars? The answer is yes. There are quite a few. Um, they are called, unsurprisingly, Tatooines. Um, uh, I know, and I'm not even that big of a Star Wars fan. Uh, Star Trek and Stargator are my guys. But um, yeah, so these are Tatooine-like planets. They orbit binary stars. Um, we have found what are called circumbinary planets, which orbit both stars. Um, and we have found, uh, uh, there's, there's a technical name for them. We've also found planets orbiting a single star in a binary system. So you have two stars orbiting each other and a planet orbiting one of those stars or orbiting both of them. Um, there was recently a discovery of a circumtrinary planet where you have three stars and the planet orbiting all three. Uh, so clearly planets don't care that much about what their stars are like. Um, are they in the habitable zone? I don't know. Um, for, for, for various reasons I can't go into, I've been doing a lot of math about this recently. And it turns out... Um, uh, there, there's a lot of stable configurations for planets in systems like this. So as long as you're close enough to one of those two stars, um, you can orbit that single star stably, even though there's another star out, out there. Um, if it's a pair of red dwarfs, you have to be close in to be habitable. And the closer you are to the star, the less the other star affects you. So you're really stable orbit, you're close in. Yeah, so there's, there's no reason why, if you have like red dwarf binaries, you couldn't have planets orbiting both of them. Uh, and in fact, the nearest star system to the Earth is Alpha Centauri. It's two stars, more or less like the Sun, uh, that orbit each other. And a third star, which is a red dwarf called Proxima Centauri, which orbits them. And we have found two planets orbiting Proxima for sure, and there may be planets orbiting one of the two stars of Alpha Centauri, and I get this mixed up, maybe both, but either way, it's like the closest star in the entire universe is a triple system, and it's possible that all three of them have planets. Possible. We know that one of them does, and one of the other ones might. 
Uh, and, and so, you know, you can have planets close in, far out, whatever. So they're, they're going to be, I mean, it's just, the universe is really good at mixing things up. So I will guarantee you we'll find binaries with planets in the in a habitable zone. Whether it's close to one star or looking at both of them, which gives you a lot more heat. But still, yeah, it's absolutely possible. I don't know if it's happened, but it's possible. Yes, okay, last question. All right, thanks for taking me. Um, sure. I had a longer one, I'll shorten it. If uh -oh. I can do like a little two-parter. One, um, Europa, Jupiter's moon. Is it true that the ocean is 60 miles deep? Or is that just speculation? Um, ooh, of course, the last question is hard. Um, <laughs> I, I would say That's, that we don't know exactly how deep it is. And by deep, you mean like thick from the bottom to the top where the ice right. shell is? Actual water. Yeah, the yeah. amount in there um, is hard to pin down. Okay. Uh, you can't see it. We don't see it directly. But um, there have been probes that have passed by Europa. Um, and when they do that, if it were solid versus liquid, the, the way the gravity changes as you pass by it changes and they can measure that. And so they have an idea of how deep it is and also they're just theoretical considerations. We, we know how much Europa is being stretched and squeezed by Jupiter. We know how much energy that generates and it turns out it's a lot. Um, it's enough to melt a moon. Uh, and so you can calculate you know, if we, we kind of have an idea of how big the core is, and you can calculate how much energy, how much water it's melted, and yeah, you get something, whatever the depth is. I don't know if it's 60 or not, but I do know that you can, you, there's, there's a picture you can find online of the Earth with, a, with like all the water on the Earth collected as a drop, and then next to it is the drop for Europa, and it's bigger. Yeah. So, you know, pretty much Europa either has as much water as Earth or more. So if water is your big deal, if that's what you're looking for, Europa is a good place to look for life. Excellent. The other one was, um, could you talk a little bit on the techniques, like new techniques that are being used to measure atmosphere on exoplanets and faraway planets? Oh boy. Yeah, so we have an hour, right? Um, no, this, this, is actually, this actually isn't, isn't too hard. Um, if you have a planet like Jupiter, which is mostly atmosphere, and the atmosphere just kind of, it doesn't just end, it just kind of gets thinner and thinner and thinner as you go up higher and higher. If that passes in front of its star, transits the star, we see that starlight drop. But more than that, some of that starlight is passing through that planet's atmosphere to get to us. And things like, say, uh, 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 methane. Methane loves to absorb certain colors of light, um, typically in the infrared. So if that star is putting on infrared light, it passes through the atmosphere of that planet, there's methane in the atmosphere of that planet, and we look at the different colors, some of those colors are missing. Um, this is called absorption spectroscopy, and this is something I did with Hubble. So um, I can give you a lot of detail, um, but I won't because I think you're gonna lose your mind if I do. Um, so the point is we can actually, as these planets transit their stars, we can look for what's missing and identify what elements are, er, and molecules are in their atmospheres. You can also get their temperatures and pressures some, sometimes as well. And so we actually have seen, we've looked at the atmospheres of lots of these uh, giant planets orbiting their stars. Uh, and there's a whole field of astronomy basically studying that. So that, again, that's magic to me that 30 years ago we didn't know of any planets and now we're looking at the atmospheres of a whole bunch of them and we're, it's for real. It's amazing. Astronomy is super cool. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. oh, the mic's off. So while they're turning her mic on, I'll just say that you can find me at sci-fi.com slash badastronomy. I have a newsletter, badastronomy.substack.com, and if you're on Twitter, I'm at badastronomer. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, nope, nope, too late. You're getting a mic. Is the mic on? I was saying, <laughs> I knew we were in for a treat, but I think this was spectacular. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.